Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you're here today. Today, I have a very special interview in store for you. In fact, I had so much fun with it, and we covered two really exciting topics that I decided to split it into two parts. I don't usually do that, but our conversation really existed in two parts, and so I think it'll make a little more sense. You'll be able to get a little more value out of it that way. Today in part one, you're going to be seeing an interview around the idea of priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church. And I'm talking to Father Dwight Longenecker, who is a married Catholic priest who gives a really interesting perspective on this issue of priestly celibacy. I really hope you enjoy it. But before we get started, I just want to say a real quick thank you to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers for making this possible. They allow this channel to be continually sustainable and grow into exciting and new things, especially to my patrons who out of their great generosity give monthly to this channel. You guys are the best. If you're interested in becoming a patron today, you can do so using the link below and that would really mean a lot to me. In any case, I hope you guys enjoy this interview and here it is. Well, hey everyone, welcome or welcome back. Today I am joined by Father Dwight Longenecker. He was brought up in an evangelical home in Pennsylvania after graduating from the fundamentalist Bob Jones University with a degree in speech and English, and he went on to study theology at Oxford University. Eventually, he was ordained as an Anglican priest and served as a curate, a school chaplain in Cambridge, and a country parson on the Isle of Wight. After realizing that he and the Anglican Church were on divergent paths, in 1995, he and his family were received into the Catholic Church. For 10 years, they continued to live in England, where he worked as a freelance writer and charity worker. Then in 2006, the door opened to return to the USA and be ordained as a Catholic priest. He now serves as pastor of Our Lady of the Rosary Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Father Dwight Longenecker, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it is absolutely my pleasure. And so that biographical kind of summary there hinted at a bit of it, saying that you were on divergent paths with the Anglican Church, but can you tell me a bit more about how you became Catholic? Yeah. Um, I, when I was at Bob Jones, I met a uh, Catholic laywoman. <clears throat> I went to do some yard work for her, and a friendship developed. And um, as I was then became an Anglican, when I went to England, my understanding of the Anglican faith moved in a much more Catholic direction. I was much more open to Catholic thought and Catholic practice. Uh, you probably know within the Anglican Church, there's a whole range of different uh, they call churchmanships. There's there's evangelical uh, low church, which is virtually Presbyterian in its theology and practice, uh, right up through to Anglo-Catholic, which very often looks more Catholic than the Catholics. It's it's very full of ornate ritual and so forth, and Catholic theology and, and devotions. Uh, and so I was moving in that direction. And then in the um, late 1980s, early 1990s, the Church of England was debating the question of women's ordination to the priesthood. And that made me uh, really uh, draw things into a focus on the question of authority in the church. So put, put very simply, um, when uh, two different groups of Christians disagree, um, it's easy to demonize the other side, say, oh, you're all, you know, you're, you're, you're wrong. But in fact, I, I would try to be open-minded and recognize that both sides were prayerful, good Christian people who really believed that the Bible and the Holy Spirit and so forth was leading them in one way, and another group who were also, um, you know, very good Christian people, believing exactly the opposite. Uh, and so I therefore went back to look again at the authority claims of the Catholic Church, uh, and that really brought me into um, uh, to realization that the you know the Catholics have an umpire in the game. Um, it's called the Pope, <laughs> and um, but for, not just the papal authority. That the authority of the Catholic Church on its on a in itself is is um, well again very briefly. It, it's universal. It, it's universal uh, in time in in as much as it goes back two thousand years. Uh, it's universal geographically in as much as it's not just answering questions in England or America or Europe or Asia, but really has the weight. Uh, and, and the size to be able to consult globally on a question. Uh, and then it also has a kind of intellectual universality. Uh, in other words, it, it draws together the thinking, the Christian thinking, uh, the theology, the philosophy, and so forth, right back through, again, for 2,000 years, as well as contemporary uh, intellectual um, weight 
both in theology, but also in other areas. So for instance, in if you're trying to decide about genetic engineering, the Catholic Church will actually draw on uh, scientists and, and uh, geneticists and so forth to find out uh, an ethicist to talk. In other words, there's a, there's a broad kind of authority there, which is not just the Pope getting up and saying, you know, this, that, or the other. Um, it, it's the authority of the whole church. And so that drew me to the Catholic Church. Yes, and thank you for sharing. And for those that aren't familiar, they they could have gone past this briefly, but to go from Bob Jones University to even Anglicanism, I imagine, was a big step. And then into Catholicism was quite the journey, was it not? Yeah, it was. It, it took about 20 years to get there. But um, when I was at college, I, I was an English and speech major, so I was very interested in uh, English uh, literature, drama, and so forth. And I can remember clearly uh, reading, you know, John Donne, George Herbert, and T.S. Eliot, and all these great English writers and saying, but, you know, they're obviously Christians, but they're not Southern Baptists. So what were they? Uh, and they were this thing called Anglican. And we were allowed to go to a little Anglican church in Greenville, uh, which was a breakaway from the Episcopal Church. So it all kind of clicked. And and um, uh, me and a group of my friends who were, I have to admit, we were a bit snob, we were snobs, really. But um, well, everybody off, went off to the Baptist church and sang Hallelujah Chorus as we were going off to the Anglican church and being English. <laughs> so um, that was part of the story, too. Yeah, well, well, thanks for sharing that. I've definitely seen that trend. Um, I don't know how much you know of me, but I'm a theology student at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago that's mm -hmm. been investigating Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And there's definitely a trend among the, I, I don't want to, I don't know how to say it, maybe more highbrow theology students that go to Anglican churches. And so that it's interesting to see uh, a bit of that trend that happened at Bob Jones well, at that time. Yeah. And I mean, it can, one can be forgiven for this because, you, you know, um, Anglicanism does have a rich cultural heritage, uh, musically, architecturally. Um, like I say, the, some of the greatest English writers uh, come from the Anglican church, C.S. Lewis, Dorothy Sayers, all these people. Um, and then there's England itself, you know, the the, the Oxford and Cambridge and the, the whole English thing is very tasteful and very intellectual. And um, uh, and, and it's actually a, a saving grace because I, I know I don't want to, to slam my evangelical brothers and sisters too much, but there is a stream within evangelicalism, which I which I came from, which has to admit it is is anti-intellectual and, and anti um you know, history and taste and so forth, almost a kind of taking pride in, um, we ain't stuck up people like them folk, um, you know, and I'm making fun of it, but that, uh, is really destructive, especially for a young person who is, um, getting an education and learning about culture and learning about all this stuff and, and, and really soaking it all up. So Anglicanism very often provides a kind of bolt hole for people. Well, people like me, um, I, I found in a uh, atheistic secular world, someone like C.S. Lewis, for instance, was a great lifeline. Um, he, he was obviously one of the cleverest people in, in of his generation, um, one of the smartest guys. And, and I mean, his, his educational uh, and, and credentials are just in the stratosphere. And yet he was writing about uh, Orthodox Christian faith, historic Christian faith in, in a way that was accessible. He's one of my great heroes still. And so this this kind of Anglicanism is um, a safety net for a lot of a lot of young people. And sadly, um, some of that same anti-intellectual strain uh, and, and within conservative evangelicalism can actually, um, in my opinion, it, it, there's a kind of like, uh, swing away from it with a lot of young people and they end up being as atheists, you know? Um, so if, if the fundamentalism is too um, irrational uh, and too anti-intellectual, then a lot of young people will actually say, this is dumb, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving, but they don't go to Anglicanism or Catholicism because they've already been inoculated against that, already been told that those religions are, are you know, bad and wrong. So they end up kind of shipwrecking their faith. And I, I know a good number of young evangelicals who that's happened to. So, um, so although I kind of make fun of the, my, my own intellectual Anglican snobbishness <laughs> uh, in my college days, um, it, was a, it was a lifeline for me. It was, it was a, a real bridge. Um, and uh, in many ways, I still miss Anglicanism and England. Yes. Well, well, thank you for that. And 
I, I can make fun of myself for that as well as in, in my journey of investigating these things for the past year, I've been attending mm-hmm. an Anglican church in Chicago as right. well, and I'm a theology major. So I, I fit the bill of, of the, the group that I can uh, poke fun at a bit as well. But I want to right. ask a little bit, and it, it came up in your bio, that in 2006, the door opened for you to return to the U.S. and be ordained as a Catholic priest. Now, for a lot of people, they... They might not be familiar with this. They might assume that there are no married priests and that that's a contradiction in terms. So what exactly happened around this time that made it possible for you to become a priest? Yeah, well, this goes back to to the uh, late 1970s when the Episcopal Church in the United States or, voted to ordain women as priests. A group of um, Episcopal priests in the U.S. had heard that Pope Pius XII in the 1950s had made an exception for a group of, uh, I think, Lutheran pastors from, I think, Sweden or Denmark to come into the Catholic Church and be ordained as Catholic priests, even though they were married. So the rule about being celibate, uh, if you're a, a Catholic um, a Catholic priest, is a discipline of the church. It's not a dogma. And the Catholic Church, therefore, has an authority to change or make exceptions to, to matters of discipline. Another example of a matter of discipline is like the liturgy that we use, the words that we use for liturgy. The Catholic Church can change this because it's discipline, not dogma. Uh, not doctrine. Um, something like the virgin birth is is dogma, and the Catholic Church, the Pope couldn't change it even if he wanted to. Okay, so, but so they, they Pope Pius XII had made this distinct this exception in the 1950s, and these American priests, Episcopalians, with typical American chutzpah, sort of wrote to Pope Paul, Paul VI and said, "Hey, what about us? We want to be ordained too, uh, and become Catholics." And Pope Paul VI it was right at the end of his pontificate, and. Um, so uh, he died, and uh, then Pope John Paul I was elected and was only pope for 30 days, and then Pope John Paul II, um, this paperwork was still on the, on the intray, if you like, and Pope John Paul II then said, let's uh, be generous to these men. So the first ones were a group of men in the 1970s, a small group, uh, for whom uh, Rome made an exception to the rule of celibacy, allowing them to be ordained as Catholic priests. And then by the this continued on, and then by the um, 1990s, when this same crisis hit the Church of England, Pope Benedict, um, Pope John Paul II, and then Pope Benedict also um, uh, extended the rule to, to England, and now it's available around the world uh, that if a bishop wants um, this convert priest to be ordained as a Catholic priest, he can apply to Rome on a case by case basis, and then you have to do a whole lot of paperwork and all the rest, and then it goes to Rome and it comes back and you get permission. So if anybody objects, I say, take it up with Pope Benedict. He signed the paperwork for me. That's awesome. And, and thank you so much for sharing that. And it's really interesting, I think, to hear that. And I think it'll be just very surprising for some people to hear about this group of married men who are also Catholic priests. And well, I'm curious- if I'm to comment as well, very often um, the Catholic Church is, is viewed as being hidebound and legalistic and in flexible and all the rest of this stuff. And my case shows that actually it's not inflexible. It's actually pretty flexible um, and adaptable. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that's going to lead to people having more questions about this in general being, so if this is a discipline and it can be changed in some instances, well, why isn't it changed in general? And I know that's something that people will bring up sometimes. And I'd be curious just how your personal experience of being a married priest uh, has formed your thinking around this idea of priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church? Well, there are two different issues here. One is the practicalities of it. Um, the Catholic Church has actually, for centuries, operated with, um, I have to be honest, uh, low paid. Uh, labor, okay, uh, by taking a vow of celibacy and usually a vow of poverty, um, the priests and the monks and nuns have been able to serve the Lord really in a, a kind of missionary situation where um, they can, you know, my, my celibate priest friends, for instance, will get moved to a new parish and almost overnight they're packing up the few boxes they have and off, you know, load up the car and off they go. So there's a real missionary um, uh, cutting edge to this, you know, when it works well. Um, and so the infrastructure is not really there to, in most places to cope with married men and their families. Um, you're talking about rectory houses and pension plans and health care and all the expenses that go with it, which the Catholic Church could afford, but we're just not used to it. Okay, we're just not used. So there's the practical aspect. Um, 
There's the practical aspect for the married priest himself and his family. Um, I'm blessed with a really smart, um, um, you know, down to earth wife who just rolls with things and doesn't cope. Other, you know, it's not always easy uh, to be a, the wife and family of a, of a priest. Um, so there are those practical and pastoral um, aspects to it, which one has to cope with and deal with. And, I, and then the Catholic Church, while I say it's flexible, it's not. Um, it's not that flexible to, to be able to roll with this. Also, you're dealing with it on a global level. So uh, while it might be all well and good to uh, for married uh, suburban, well-off um, congregations uh, to, to support a married man in, in America, um, in Africa or Asia, in, in places where there's persecution and so forth, uh, that missionary edge to the Catholic priesthood really comes into its own. Um, and so uh, if the church changes, the Catholic Church changes it, it's again, it's not considering only what people in Western Europe and America can deal with, but it's also looking at the at the situation around the world. And it's complicated. I mean, in Africa, celibacy for priests is very difficult because the whole culture does not understand celibacy. So it's 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 a complicated question. But the other aspect to it, that's the practical side. The other aspect is the theological side. And we have not really done much work on this because, um, in fact, the interface between uh, ordination and following the Lord as a priest and following the Lord as a married man is actually beautifully complementary. So um, Christ says, of, the Bible says, of course, that um, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So there's this nuptial imagery uh, within the call to the Lord, but it's also there. Um, it's also there uh, in within within marriage and within the priesthood together. So I, I see the two as being complementary. Others see it as being contradictory. So there's work to be done on that. And I'm um, I'm not the person to do it. I'm not really a theologian, but um, it's an interesting question. How how does uh, service to the Lord serve as a married person? Uh, uh, also serve as a complete dedication. The best examples I know of this are, are actually my evangelical friends. Um, I have a friend, for instance, from Bob Jones days, um, and he and his wife both wanted to be missionaries in primitive conditions. So they trained, they both trained in theology, in healthcare, and in, and in linguistics. And they have spent their whole lives in the hill mountains of Burma with a primitive tribe that had no written language. And they went there, settled, learned the language by listening to it. Then they developed an alphabet, and he began translating the New Testament from Greek into this primitive language for which he had already developed the alphabet and teaching the people to read. It's his whole lifetime's work. He went there with his wife and five kids. Now, that's the kind of example of uh, married uh, total dedication that, that, that you would need, I think, in the Catholic priesthood. But and I would I would say actually for any uh, married ministers, but that's that's a pretty rare and amazing example. That is truly amazing, and I will say just as an anecdote, one of my favorite parts of the Moody Bible Institute campus is they have this interactive wall that because Moody has been involved in missions since its founding, yeah, mm -hmm. and you can you know, there's dots all over it, and you can click anywhere on it, and it's of people from Moody who have served all over the world and. Almost most of them being married couples, and so it it's certainly not unheard of to have that kind of missionary zeal uh, and to be able to do that in um, a married context. But I, I definitely understand as well what you're saying about the practical implications of this. Of you know, could you do this for Catholic priests all over the world as far as expenses and just the the shift in the Catholic Church? And so, would you see this as you know for for the foreseeable future? the Catholic Church will continue to have converts who come into the church and are married priests, but will continue to be a, a very small minority? Or do you think there's a chance that the Catholic Church would one day have more uh, married priests than they do now? I, I don't think it's likely to happen very soon. Um, because again, going back to the um, both the practical side, which is cumbersome for a lot of Catholics to be able to cope with this, uh, both on the parish level and the diocesan level. My own parish and diocese have coped with it very well because there's only a few of us. Uh, there's about three or three or four married priests in our diocese, and we're, we have way more than anybody else. So we're we're a bit top heavy on that. But um, 
but the other practicality is the other theological aspect, sorry, for Catholics is that the Catholic Church has really um, also over the years while developing a high, a high understanding of, of ministry and being celibate and poor, um, at the same time, it has developed a very profound understanding of the married life and the family life uh, and saying that for a married man, for the majority of married men and women, that is their vocation. That's why in our we have seven sacraments in the Catholic Church, and why two of the sacraments are called the sacraments of service, um, and their ordination and marriage. Okay, so ordination and marriage within our sacramental system are also seen um, as complementary, so that um, the way we put it is the, the celibate person is showing to the married person what it means to be totally dedicated to, to the Lord. And the married person is showing to the celibate person what it means to be married and be totally dedicated to a spouse because the celibate person is married to Jesus. So it, it's, it, it's a, there's a beautiful complementarity there and it's not contradictory. And that's one of the reasons why the Catholic church is unlikely to open the, the priesthood to, to, to married people um, because of this history of, of this theology that I've just explained from, of both marriage and, and ordination, um, it may change, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way of putting it. And correct me if this is an unfair characterization, but it, what I hear you saying is, you know, some people might assume that the Catholic Church wouldn't have married priests because they think too low of marriage. But in fact, what it seems that you're saying is actually it's because they have such a robust theology of marriage and a high place for it that they wouldn't have married priests because of the unique calling of ordination and marriage. Yeah, it can't be denied that there is a kind of Manichaean um, heresy that is underlying some of the Catholic understandings of um, celibacy. You, you'll remember from your theology that Man Manichaeism is, is, a, is a form of Gnosticism, which is dualistic and says that um, the physical world is inferior. Um, <clears throat> and out of that, that of course, the, the sexual act is dirty uh, and sinful just by its very nature. And this is, this is a strand within early, um, within the first five centuries of the church, uh, where Manichaeism in the East was, was actually very powerful influence, but also filtering down through the rest of Catholic um, devotional and practice is this misunderstanding and saying that um, the physical world is inferior uh, and um, the physical world and therefore the, the most physical aspects of sex and, and so forth, anything below the belt is really dirty. Um, <laughs> really simple. And, and so that can't be denied that that has been a strand of a, a, a bad aspect of some of the Catholic teaching. The highest aspect of Catholic teaching, however, repudiates that heresy and says, no, 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 that's a heresy um, that is not proper Catholic teaching. In fact, because we place marriage as a sacrament, um, we have a higher view than marriage than anybody. And let me, if I can just take a moment to explain this, yeah. this is Conversations are going in an interesting direction. Um, Catholics believe that uh, every sacrament has um, something called form and matter and proper minister. So the, the proper form, for instance, uh, for um, the Eucharist is the, all, the, all the words in the big red book that the priest has to say for, for the um, Eucharist to be valid. The proper matter for the, for, the, for the Eucharist is bread and wine, the physical stuff that we use for the sacrament. So for baptism, it's water, and the proper form is, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, well, for marriage, the sacrament of marriage, the proper form is the words in the marriage wedding book that the priest uses, but the proper minister of the sacrament <clears throat> is not the priest. It's the husband, it's the bride and the groom. The bride and the groom minister the sacrament to each other, and if I can, um, you don't mind me getting uh, physical about it. The the physical matter for the sacrament of marriage, uh, I ask my marriage couples this, what do you think the matter is? They'll say the ring, no. Uh, the kiss, no. And I say, the matter is actually consummating the marriage. The matter is sexual intercourse. Now, when you apply Catholic theology here, we're saying in the sacramental theology, God's grace in Eucharist, God's grace comes to us that, that that the bread and the wine and the matter are transformed and God's grace comes to us in a supernatural way. So when you extend that over to marriage, you're therefore saying that the sexual act is transformed from within 
And God's grace comes to the couple through that. Now, you talk about a high view of marriage. This is really a high view of marriage and sex. So we're, we're rather than the Catholic Church being down on sex and saying it's dirty, 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 what we're saying is, no, it, we have the highest view and understanding of sex of anybody, that it is actually a, a means of grace. So um, I don't know whether you understand, got, you picked all that up. I don't know how much sacramental theology you do at Moody Bible Institute. But, but you know, uh, I don't know. Do you find that interesting? I find that very interesting. And I, I say we do some. I, I will say that the most influential professors on me that I've had there, that I also think are the finest professors at Moody, are some of the Anglicans there. And mm -hmm. one of them I actually had a discussion with. Uh, we, we talked pretty frequently. And he was saying that the, the staff was invited to, or tasked with writing a book on marriage, and they wanted to title it An Evangelical Theology of Marriage. And he said he kind of sat there and cringed and thought, the Catholic Church has been teaching about this for a while. Can we can we not title it that? And so, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and the uh, the way you right. broke that down was really helpful. Well, and, and also, this is why uh, we, the Catholic Church, has always been down on all of the things that break marriage, because we say this is such a, uh, I sometimes say that this, this marriage is like a, a a precious crystal goblet. It is very fragile and it's very precious and it's very beautiful and it's easily broken and it is very difficult to fix it. Therefore, all the things that break marriage, pornography and masturbation and prostitution and human trafficking and adultery and fornication and all the great long list of sex sins, which everybody says the Catholic Church is making everybody feel guilty about. No, we, we, we say that those are bad because they break marriage. They break this beautiful thing that God's given the human race. Well, that that is very helpful. And, and I love the way that you tied that into sacramental theology and just the Catholic view of marriage. And I also like how you brought up at the beginning there that, you know, recognizing that there has been strains in Catholic teaching throughout time of this kind of Gnosticism that is always lapped at the shores of the church that we, we can't ever seem to like fully get away from, but that the, the best teaching does rise above it. And as you brought up Manichaeism, I, I could think of, you know, if anyone's read Augustine's Confessions, they've certainly seen that wrestling going on. So thank you so much for all of that. Yeah, uh, actually, Augustine um, is uh, writing from within the, uh, the the context in in the, is he 5th century? Um, when, when this whole um, thing is, is brewing over, the, the extremes of early monasticism also in the Catholic Church are showing the influence of Manichaeism. Um, you know, that uh, the physical world is dirty. That's why you have to do such excessive fasting and excessive asceticism. I don't know if you've come across St. Simeon Stylites, for instance, who sat on a, a pillar in the Syrian desert for 35 years and, and you know, was... <laughs> that. So there's this extreme asceticism and extreme negativity about sex, which really um, filters right down through the Middle Ages as well. And um, the, the, but, it's, it, but it's never been... Um, Orthodox Catholic teaching. Uh, the Catholic Church has always been clear that that was a heresy, even though it's an easy one to fall into. Well, I hope you enjoyed this part one of my conversation with Father Dwight Longenecker. And hey, I want to say a real quick thank you to our sponsor today, Kindred. Kindred is a company that makes these beautiful Bibles filled with pictures and just really set in a different way that takes the beauty of Scripture's content and places it in a beautiful format. It'll cause you to read the Bible more slowly and contemplatively and really allow you to re-engage with Scripture. Whether you're new to reading the Bible or you've been reading it for a long time, it will help you approach Scripture in a way that really allows you to get the most out of it. And so I want to really encourage you to check them out. If you want to get one, you can go to kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order. Thank you.